accelerates at a continued rate and it goes unchecked and it'll just rip. And I'm terrified by it. The infamous San Andreas Fault is making headlines. This fault bridges the North American and Pacific tectonic plates for 1,200 kilometers through California. According to recent reports, the southern stretch of the fault is on the brink, locked, loaded, and ready to shake things up. The Southern California Earthquake Center has asked Californians to brace for impact as it's not business as usual. What groundbreaking information have scientists unearthed? And more importantly, what's its significance for California residents? Join us as we unravel why scientists have just announced that the San Andreas Fault is about to do something massive. An extensive fault exists in California spanning 800 miles from the southern Salton Sea to the northern Cape Mendocino. Named the San Andreas Fault, this geological division intersects vital locations such as vineyard subway stations, power lines, and water mains. Millions of individuals reside and work close to this fault, transiting through the 966 roads that intersect with it daily. Despite its frequent use, many people fail to recognize the potential threat it poses. This fault line can wreak havoc on lives, properties, and the national economy at a moment's notice. In a recent communication, Thomas Jordan, the former director of the Southern California Earthquake Center, conveyed a disturbing message. According to Jordan, the San Andreas Fault is in a critical state, hinting at the imminent possibility of a significant earthquake. This message should have prompted a heightened sense of urgency among California residents, but it seems to have had no effect. While warnings about the looming danger are not novel to Californians, the current announcement emphasizes the severity of the situation. The impending earthquake is anticipated to be highly destructive, particularly in the southern region of the San Andreas Fault. Looking at the records, the southern segment of the San Andreas Fault has not undergone a significant release of stress since 1857. This makes a possible earthquake in the region a destructive one. The San Andreas Fault system marks the boundary between the Pacific and North American tectonic plates. Both plates are moving northward, but the Pacific plate's faster pace leads to a continual buildup of stress between them. Previous notable stress releases resulted in catastrophic events, such as the 1906 7.8 magnitude earthquake in the San Francisco Bay Area and the 1989 6.9 magnitude Loma Prieta earthquake in Northern California. Significantly, events of a comparable magnitude have been absent from the southern part of the San Andreas Fault for an extended period. This underscores the importance of heeding Jordan's predictions and emphasizes the urgent need for preparedness in anticipation of a potentially devastating seismic occurrence. Even though the Northridge earthquake in 1994 was linked to a different nearby fault system, the absence of an earthquake raised the possibility that one was on the way. It also emphasizes that given the potential buildup of stress, the quake would be a big one when it happened. But how big could this potential earthquake be? Could the devastation shown in the movie San Andreas actually occur? The answers to these questions will satisfy Californians to some extent. In the film, the San Andreas Fault creates a 9.0 magnitude earthquake. While recognized on a global scale, earthquakes of this magnitude are normally confined to places on the globe where subduction occurs, such as Chile and Japan. California's geological condition is unique regarding plates moving past each other. Thus, many projections restrict the maximum magnitude of earthquakes along the San Andreas Fault System to 8.0. The prediction comes with a 7% possibility that such an event may occur in Southern California. The likelihood of a magnitude 7.0 event occurring within the next 30 years is also 75%. Although the magnitudes of 7.0, 8.0, and 9.0 may seem insignificant, the energy that these events release varies greatly. A magnitude 9.0 event 
releases 32 times more energy than an 8.0 event and 1,000 times more energy than a 7.0 event. Whether a 7.0 or an 8.0 event, damage is inevitable, but the entire sequence of events portrayed in the Dwayne Johnson movie is unlikely. For instance, the San Andreas Fault, situated beneath land rather than the ocean, lacks the potential to displace sufficient water to generate a tsunami. The notion of a colossal depth forming is also relegated to fantasy, since the plates involved slide relative to each other rather than away. What happens in reality is the anticipation of significant destruction. There's no foolproof way to render a building utterly resistant to the impending natural disaster. This is despite the stringent building codes in California that advocate seismic protection measures for older structures and the prohibition of new constructions near recognized fault lines. If this event is bound to happen, a thorough understanding of the fault zone is imperative to understand its impact. In this context, there are three distinct fault zones, the northern, the southern, and the central. The northern segment extends from Hollister through the Santa Cruz Mountains, marked as the epicenter of the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. It then crosses the San Francisco Peninsula, initially identified by Professor Lawson in 1895. It resurfaces offshore near Muscle Rock in Daly City, where the 1906 San Francisco earthquake's epicenter was located. The fault emerges again at Bolinas Lagoon in Marin County, just north of Stinson, and returns underwater through Tamal Bay's linear trough, which runs east of Bodega Head through Bodega Bay and then submerges again. It resurfaces on shore at Fort Ross, where several significant sister faults run more or less parallel around the San Francisco Bay area. Each of these faults is capable of producing destructive earthquakes. Continuing overland from Fort Ross, the northern segment forms a linear valley through which the Gualala River partly flows before returning to the sea at Point Arena. The northern segment further extends underwater along the coast until it reaches Cape Mendocino. At this point, it takes a westward bend and ends at the Mendocino Triple Junction. Another significant section of the San Andreas Fault is the central segment, running northwest from Parkfield to Hollister. While earthquakes are known to occur in the southern part of the fault and some areas around Parkfield, the rest of the central section exhibits a seismic creep. In this process, the fault slips continuously without triggering earthquakes, a characteristic resulting from its transform boundary origins. The southern segment of the fault, known as the Mojave segment, starts in California near Bombay Beach. Upturned strata associated with this section can be observed in Box Canyon near the Salton Sea. The fault then courses along the southern base of the San Bernardino Mountains, passing through Cajun Pass and veering northwest along the northern base of the San Gabriel Mountains. These mountains, known as the Transverse Range, owe their formation to the movement along the San Andreas Fault. A visible section of the fault can be seen in Palmdale, where it intersects with the Antelope Valley Freeway. Progressing northwest along Elizabeth Lake Road, it reaches the town of Elizabeth Lake. Passing through Gorman, Tijon Pass, and Fraser Park, the fault begins to curve northward, creating the Big Bend. This restraining bend is believed to be where the fault experiences locking in Southern California, with a recurrence interval for earthquakes estimated at 140 to 160 years. Continuing its northwest trajectory from Fraser Park, the fault crosses the Carrizo Plain, a vast treeless expanse where much of the fault is prominently visible. The Elkhorn Scarp runs the length of the fault trace within the plain. It is now widely recognized that the southern segment, stretching from Parkfield in Monterey County to the Salton Sea, has the potential for an 8.1 magnitude earthquake. The fault extends approximately 35 miles northeast of Los Angeles. A substantial earthquake in this southern segment could result in the loss of thousands of lives. It could also cause hundreds of billions of dollars in damage in Los Angeles, San Bernardino, Riverside, and the surrounding areas. However, even after identifying the fault's location, scientists had to conduct further research to better understand the potential effects of a significant southern San Andreas earthquake. 
To address this need, the U.S. Geological Survey developed a 7.8 magnitude scenario, known as the shakeout scenario, with a slippage ranging from 2 to 7 meters. This model aimed to represent the accumulated stresses in the area since the last major event. According to the shakeout scenario, it was determined that structures straddling the fault would bear the brunt of the damage. Fortunately, owing to the 1972 Alquist Priolo Earthquake Fault Zoning Act, such vulnerable structures are now scarce. However, the slippage would impact 966 roads, 90 fiber optic cables, 39 gas pipes, and 141 power lines crossing the fault zone. The estimated cost of building damage alone was staggering, reaching around $33 billion. Modern constructions fare relatively well, but older buildings are especially susceptible. In the aftermath, fires would pose a significant threat, reminiscent of the Northridge earthquake. Gas mains and water pipes would be severed during the catastrophe, and the resulting fires are anticipated to incur more substantial costs than the initial shaking. The projected death toll was estimated to be around 1,800. To compound the challenges, the main event would destabilize the region's tectonics, leading to a series of potentially potent aftershocks. For instance, Christchurch, New Zealand, experienced a 6.2 magnitude earthquake in 2011, followed by over 10,000 aftershocks in the city and surrounding regions. To address the possibility of an impending earthquake, NASA has become involved, utilizing radar to provide a 3D aerial view of the San Andreas Fault. Off the coast of California, two major plates collided, the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate. They slowly drifted northwest, grinding along the margin of the North American Plate to the east. This collision between two major tectonic plates created the 800-mile-long fracture zone known as the San Andreas Fault. When they meet, a distinct trough runs along the length of the fault, and the Crystal Springs Reservoir fills it, marking the underlying fault. The false color NASA radar image of the fault, west of San Francisco Bay, visually represents this geological feature. In the image, I-280 curves along the east side of the fault, and California Highway 92 heads west towards Half Moon Bay. Captured in November 2008, this image was part of a campaign to regularly collect detailed three-dimensional images of the San Andreas Fault along the exact flight path. The objective is to map the segments of the fault where tectonic plates are gradually creeping past each other, with some areas exhibiting a slight stickiness while others appear firmly locked together. These locked regions are fascinating because they signify places where pent-up stress could be suddenly released in a major earthquake. Scientists achieve this mapping by identifying locations where the topography is visibly deformed. They can detect ground deformation by repeatedly capturing images along an identical flight path. The deformation may be as subtle as a fraction of an inch, indicating that the tectonic plates are stuck together below the surface. Presently, the San Andreas Fault is divided into three distinct sections, each capable of independent movement. As mentioned earlier, NASA discovered that the plates in all three sections are attempting to move past each other in opposite directions, resembling two hands rubbing against each other. Notably, the plates in the southern and northern sections are often locked together in a dangerous, immobile embrace. This leads to accumulated stresses over extended periods, spanning decades to centuries. Eventually, a breaking point is reached, causing the two sides to lurch violently past each other, resulting in an earthquake. However, the central section stands out, as the plates there smoothly slip past each other at a consistent rate of around 26 millimeters per year. This steady movement helps prevent the occurrence of a massive earthquake, at least according to the prevailing scientific consensus. Nevertheless, a recent study involving rocks drilled nearly two miles beneath the surface challenges this understanding. The research was recently published in the online edition of the journal, Geology. It utilized advanced chemical analysis methods to gauge rock heating during prehistoric earthquakes. Genevieve Coffey, 
the lead author and a graduate student at Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, had some interesting input. The research findings suggest that the central section has experienced numerous major earthquakes, some possibly relatively recent. This implies a potential for more significant earthquakes in the section than previously believed. The study emphasizes the need for awareness that the San Andreas Fault poses various dangers, challenging the assumption of continuous creep. Historically, the fault's northern section was the epicenter of the devastating 1906 San Francisco earthquake, claiming 3,000 lives and leveling much of the city. In 1989, the magnitude 6.9 Loma Prieta earthquake struck, causing over 60 casualties and destroying a major elevated motorway. The southern section was responsible for the 1994 magnitude 6.7 Northridge earthquake near Los Angeles, which resulted in approximately 60 fatalities. Numerous scientists speculate that the San Andreas Fault is accumulating energy for an event on the scale of the 1906 earthquake. In contrast, the central section seemed relatively peaceful until recently, with only a small area near its southern end known for producing genuine earthquakes. Although not particularly dangerous by most standards, these magnitude 6 events occur approximately every 20 years. Given their frequency, scientists established a major observatory atop the fault near Parkfield to study clues that might indicate an impending earthquake. This observatory encompasses a 3.2 kilometer deep borehole, extracting rock cores and monitoring instruments above and below ground. Researchers, including Coffey and her colleagues, examined a rock near the bottom of the borehole. During earthquake fault slippage, friction along moving parts can elevate temperatures hundreds of degrees higher than the surrounding rocks. This alters the organic compound makeup of sedimentary formations along the fault path. Study co-authors Pratigya Polisar and Heather Savage recently discovered a way to exploit these biomarkers, using the altered compositions to map prehistoric earthquakes. By calculating the degree of heating in the rock, the researchers claim they can identify previous events and estimate how far the fault moved. From this, they determined the sizes of resulting earthquakes. The method was refined at Lamont Doherty in the United States Northeast Alaska and off the coast of Japan. In the latest study, the researchers identified many altered compositions in a band of highly disturbed sedimentary rock between 3,192 and 3,196 meters below the surface. They posit that this blackish crumbly material contains evidence of over 100 earthquakes. In most cases, the fault appears to have jumped more than 1.5 meters, implying a magnitude 6.9 earthquake similar to the destructive Loma Prieta and Northridge events. However, the researchers suggest that many of these events could have been even larger. The researchers acknowledge that their method of estimating earthquake magnitude is still evolving. However, they assert that the earthquakes along the central section were likely comparable to other significant San Andreas events. While this revelation is surprising, the current official California earthquake hazard model, which establishes building codes and insurance rates, allows for a large central section rupture. Nevertheless, including this possibility in the model was initially contentious and based on mathematical calculations, lacking concrete evidence of such prior events. The recent study marks a significant advancement, being the first to provide tangible proof of such earthquakes in the area. According to the authors, these earthquakes could have originated in the central section, or more likely, it was initiated in the north or south and migrated through the central section. The time frame of these earthquakes poses a challenging question, this is because trenches dug by paleo-seismologists across the central section have shown no disturbed soil layers indicative of surface quakes in the last 2,000 years. However, the researchers highlight that 2,000 years is a relatively brief period in geological terms. There's also the possibility that excavations might have overlooked some quakes that did not rupture the surface at specific locations. 
To address this uncertainty, the researchers employed a second innovative technique. The biomarkers they analyzed are found in narrow bands, ranging from microscopic to a few centimeters wide. Only inches or feet away, the rock heats up enough to release some or all of the naturally present gas known as argon. Sure, other scientists have traditionally used radioactivity to determine the ages of rocks. However, the authors find their novel approach advantageous in gaining further insights into the seismic history of the central section. In simple terms, potassium undergoes decay, transforming into argon. As such, the rock's age can be determined by the ratio of argon to potassium, with a higher ratio indicating an older rock. However, earthquake-induced heat can expel some or all of the argon, resetting the radioactive clock. This makes the rock appear younger than an identical, nearby unheated rock. This is precisely what the research team discovered. They examined sediments formed tens of millions of years ago in an ancient Pacific basin subducted beneath California. The potassium argon clock revealed that rocks around the thin quake slip zones were 3 to 3.2 million years old. Although this provides a time frame, it remains unclear due to uncertainties in assessing the expelled argon's quantity and how thoroughly the clock may have been reset. Consequently, the most recent earthquakes could have occurred within a few hundred or thousand years. The team is working on a new project to refine age interpretations and provide more accurate answers. The authors stress the need to incorporate the central segment of the San Andreas Fault and other creeping faults in seismic hazard analysis to understand ongoing geological processes comprehensively. Despite the potentially alarming nature of this information, scientists led by William Ellsworth of Stanford University, who conducted the research, remain relatively unconcerned. While the official state hazard assessment acknowledges the possibility of a significant earthquake, researchers argue that such events are rare. They maintain that tectonic strain is not accumulating significantly, if at all, at the moment. Seismologist Morgan Page, a co-author of the hazard assessment, considers the study groundbreaking, emphasizing the difficulty in studying the creeping section due to the continuous erasure of earthquake evidence. The potential for a large earthquake to rupture through the creeping section raises the specter of the big one, spanning the entire San Andreas Fault. Page is hopeful that the new evidence will enhance scientific models. Addressing how concerned Californians should be, geologist Stephen Cox, a co-author of the study, advises against excessive worry, improved building codes and ongoing scientific efforts to identify potential significant events contribute to preparedness. However, concerns persist, particularly in light of climate change exacerbating existing issues in California. Droughts intensified by climate change have plagued the state leading to uncontrollable wildfires. The Center for Climate and Energy Solutions Drought Monitor Map highlights severe central and southern California drought areas. The study suggests that climate change increases the likelihood of worsening droughts with potential consequences for seismic events. If the big one coincides with a drought, the ensuing fires and aftershocks could be even more devastating surpassing predictions from scenarios like the 2008 shakeout. The impact of climate change further heightens the risk of extreme fire conditions, adding to the potential chaos. The seismic events experienced at the beginning of 2023, such as the quake in Soledad and the 6.4 magnitude tremor in Humboldt County, underscore the ongoing challenges. Despite extensive efforts to understand seismic activity in California, the intersection of seismic events and climate change emphasizes the necessity for continuous research and preparedness measures. Thank you for watching another episode of Voyager. While you are still here, Click on the video on your screen to see more mind-blowing videos like this one.